Hi, my name is Mira Grover, and thank you for watching this brief video on how to take an addiction history. Uh, before we begin, let's remember that every time we're doing anything addiction medicine related or really any form of medicine related, we're always going to involve the patient. So um, we're getting patient consent for everything that we're doing and we're letting them know along the way as we go what we're doing. Very important, especially when you're taking an addiction history, to make sure that you've checked your own biases and you are managing your own countertransference well. Patients are very sensitive to uh, things that they feel might be stigmatizing, and of course there's a lot of stigma out there around addiction, so really important to make sure that you have got this down. If you are not sure about anything that we talk about in this video or any of the others, please feel free to contact an addiction medicine specialist. Um, there are options like Specialist Link or the Rapid Opioid Advice Line if you have patient-specific questions that you need answered because, of course, this video is an educational video and is not meant to give you specific patient guidance. You are, of course, responsible for your own practice. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose and no drug companies pay me. Okay. Let's get going here. So... Pro tip, when you're doing an addiction history, patients are often going to be more honest with you if you can explain why you want to know the information if you're asking in a non-judgmental manner. Uh, just a straightforward asking of questions and then explaining, you know, it's really important for me to provide you with good care uh, and I need to know the answers to these questions in order to provide you with good care. Um, not demonstrating shock at risky behavior is very, very important. Um, and explaining that knowing a solid substance use history helps with care. Um, it's just, it's super important to explain even exactly why. So I need to know how much fentanyl you use because I'm worried that you're going to go into withdrawal and I want to make sure that I can prescribe you enough opioids to prevent that from happening. When you explain it like that, people are a lot more likely to be fully uh, honest with you. So for each substance, we're gonna ask, you know, a good, get a good sense of how people use. So how much do you use typically? How much do you use at most? How much do you use at least? How do you use? What is your route? Um, when did you last use? But not just when did you last use? Did you cut down before that? Or did you increase before that? Um, getting that good timeline. How long have you used for? Have you ever been to treatment? Uh, have you ever been to counseling? Have you ever taken medications to help you with this? Um, and then also important to ask about how are you uh, able to afford this? Are you using up your, all your savings, your financial concerns? Are you uh, doing other risky behaviors in order to acquire the substances that I can help you reduce some of the harms from those risks? Like those are kind of very important, very specific questions to ask. So let's briefly talk about the types of addictions. So uh, when we talk about substances, so alcohol, of course, is our most common substance. Um, if this can be divided into beverage or non-beverage, very important to ask specifically, do you ever use non-beverage alcohol, things like mouthwash, uh, rubbing alcohol, uh, because people aren't going to volunteer that information, they're not usually particularly proud of that information, but it does give you a sense of a, how bad withdrawals are going to be and how bad this addiction has gotten if people are finding themselves you know, out of money, out of money and needing to use some of these other substances. Tobacco, of course, we're going to ask around uh, not just cigarettes, but do you chew tobacco? Do you use um, vapes? Do you use cigars? Do you combine your tobacco with cannabis? All those sorts of questions. Uh, stimulants. Uh, there's so the more common street stimulants right now in my city are uh, cocaine, crack cocaine, and meth. Meth is the most common right now. Um, things are always changing and uh, there's lots of other stimulants out there as well. People use Dexedrine, people use Vyvanse. So important just to ask uh, around these questions and get a sense of how people are using. Cannabis, of course, we know that we can uh, use, people can smoke it, they can eat it, um, and they can use shatter. So shatter is like a condensed, uh, concentrated form of like the cannabis oils that is sort of made into like hard candy kind of thing and then is uh, shattered and smoked so uh, it's just much more concentrated. Uh, we're going to ask around hallucinogens so LSD, MDMA, mushrooms and then also around the uh, context of hallucinogen use right so is there any um, like a 
is this used in a social context in any way? Is this used in a sexual context in any way? Are there any risky behaviors that um, need addressing as well? Uh, opioids. So of course we are in a fentanyl crisis right now and um, there are very, very high rates of opioid toxicity at the moment. So very, very important to ask a good detailed opioid use history. So any prescription opioid use, any illicit opioid use. Lots of times people think that they're using prescription opioids, but it wasn't prescribed to them, it was prescribed to someone else. And lots of fentanyl is currently being marketed um, as oxys or as dilaudids, but it has fentanyl mixed in and pressed into a pill that just looks the same. So really important that the patient may not know what they're using. So important to ask, did you get this from a pharmacy? Did you get this from your friend? Do you want to do a urine drug screen to see what was in the substance? So of course it is better to just test the drugs themselves rather than having people have to do a urine drug screen, which is much more invasive. But um, right now in Alberta, we are not allowed to do uh, drug testing itself. So urine drug screen is sort of our best bet to uh, get a sense of um, what is in the actual substances. Uh, okay, and then there's, of course, benzodiazepine. So people, some people use illicit benzo, so that's typically described as bars. So I use Xanax bars. Um, is how many I use in a day. It depends on the supply as to whether it's more potent or less potent than prescribed supply. Um, I have been finding that more recently it's a little bit less potent, but you just never know. So I always try and get a sense from the patient. Um, and then uh, any if they're using any prescription benzos as well, uh, it's important to get that good history. How long have you been using it for? Uh, that kind of thing. GHB is colloquially known as like the date rape drug. So it has properties similar to benzos. It can also in large quantities when taken for chronically, it can cause withdrawal seizures. So again, really important to get that good sense of how often it's being taken. Um, inhalants are often found in uh, regions where people have no access to other substances, but um, once it's become a common thing, then people might take that anywhere. So uh, inhalant's really important to get a sense of like, what do you huff, what do you sniff, how often, um, how long has this been going on for? There are of course behavioral addictions as well. They are classified differently in the DSM-5 outside of substance use disorders. Uh, it is good, really important to get a good sense of how long things have been going on for, if they've gotten any help, um, other, other risky behaviors associated with it, um, and then refer. Okay, so just like with any other uh, history, just like you know with heart, chest pain history, we're going to ask questions like, is it pleuritic? Is it uh, um, exercise induced? Um, do you have exertional dyspnea? Really important questions to ask, like red flag questions that uh, you should not miss. So these are some of the red flag questions in an addiction history that you should not miss. In alcohol, have you had a history of withdrawal seizures or delirium tremens? Um, and so, and important to clarify, you know, sometimes people are like, oh yeah, I've had DTs, but there's a difference between alcoholic hallucinosis and de delirium tremens. So alcoholic hallucinosis, milder delirium tremens, you're often ending up in the ICU. So very, very important to learn and be able to um, tease out those differences in your history. Also to get a sense of, have you had GI bleeds? Do you have cirrhosis? Um, questions like that. Okay, for opioids, very important to know, have you ever had an overdose before? Have you ever tried OAT before? Do you use harm reduction practices like using an naloxone kit? Uh, do you use sterile supplies? Do you use at a supervised consumption site? Do you ever use a loan? Very, very important to know that because that is going to give you a risk profile for this patient. Um, is this prescription opioids or illicit opioids? Have you ever used any illicit opioids? And then of course, any concurrent benzos or alcohol because anything that you use concurrently that can increase respiratory depression changes our risk profile for this patient. For benzos, uh, how long have you used them for? Uh, history of seizures during withdrawal from benzos, any concurrent opioids or alcohol. Uh, for cannabis, we specifically wanna know are you using shatter? That's um, quite a different thing than uh, other forms of cannabis. So it just tells you sort of the severity of the, um, of the cannabis use. For meth, um, does it have fentanyl in it for any other stimulants? Does it have meth in it? Is it actually made of meth? Uh, or does it have any other substances in it that you know of? 
So social acceptance of substances does not make them less harmful. Illegal substances are not necessarily inherently more harmful just because they're illegal, but they might be because not because of the substance itself, but because of what society puts on those illegal substances. So um, some harms come from the posture of society itself. So if it's illegal and you're using it, then you're more likely to use it in an alleyway. You're more likely to use it alone because you're afraid, you know, like those kinds of things. So important to kind of get a sense of what's going on for patients. It is our responsibility as practitioners to reduce the harms that substances pose to people and to help them live well, regardless of what substance they ingest, regardless of whether it's illegal or legal. Um, in terms of confidentiality, we don't, if a patient says, oh, I use illicit fentanyl, we don't get to go on the phone and call the police, you know, unless there is an imminent risk of danger to the patient or to others. Um, and then we're thinking about forms as well in that situation. So, um, of course, if we're required by a court of law to testify, we do. So we make sure patients are aware of that and that they're under, they understand kind of those laws around consent, but we don't break confidentiality unless required. So um, just important to be aware of that, make sure that the patients are aware so they feel a little bit more comfortable sharing their full substance use history with you. Uh, and I think that's all I got. So thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to take a look at my Addiction Medicine 101 video that I have up on YouTube um, and see if that can help answer any more questions. Okay, thank you very much.